four, four, three. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the second industry restart webinar um, that we're hosting jointly with Airports Council International, focusing on the travel experience. Uh, this webinar will focus on passenger processes that will support the safe reopening of aviation markets. Topics will include fitness to fly, the airport experience, onboard experience and sanitisation and cleaning. We have three presenters today, um, Pierre Charbonneau, IATA's Director of Passenger Experience and Facilita Facilitation, uh, Antoine Rostvarovsky, ACI's Deputy Director General of Programmes and Services, and Celine Canu, IATA's Head of Passenger Processes and Facilitation. Um, before handing over to, the, to Pierre, I'd just like to um, let you know that after the presentations, there'll be some time for questions. Um, and you can start putting your questions into the Q&A box now, if you'd like. Thank you, Pierre, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, and welcome everybody. Thank you for attending today's webinar. Um, the purpose of today's webinar, as Catherine said, will really focus on the travel experience, but um, to set the stage, I'd like to just take you to a bit of the mindset about setting the roadmap for a larger restart of aviation and the fact that this was really a key stakeholder engagement exercise so that we restore the services that we, we all need. So let's move on right away to the next slide, please. So what is the challenge? I'm sure uh, all of you have seen, we don't need to spend too much time on this, the disastrous effect of, of COVID and the fact that it really shut down the aviation around the world. And the challenge that we now have <clears throat> as, a, as an industry is actually to restart this industry and make sure that we, we keep uh, and protect the health and the safety of the travelers and the workers and the communities around the world and place measures in place that uh, will ensure uh, there is no further transmission of the COVID virus and so that we mitigate the risk through a series of measures in a process that will restore confidence in the public to travel and in governments to restore the um, to reopen the borders and relax to re uh, remove the restrictions. So what does that mean? It means that every stakeholder in the in the, in the ecosystem will probably have something different and, and some roles that were not there before, at least temporarily. Uh, governments will probably have to have more uh, risk assessment in terms of passengers' health. Uh, airports and airlines will need to put together different measures to make sure that we have a safe environment uh, and, uh, and sanitize environment. And also passengers will probably need to get a bit more steps in terms of taking control over their journey to make sure they're in compliance with their measures. So overall, at least at the beginning, we believe that there's going to be some temporary changes that will uh, impact the passenger experience. And we'll get into more details on, uh, on this later in the presentation. Next slide, please. So what is the goal overall? The goal, as uh, you know, is to really restore the air connectivity around the world in an internationally consistent, mutually accepted and harmonized approach. And unlike what happened during the shutdown of the borders where uh, governments had to take unilateral measures in a sometimes urgent way to reduce uh, the spread of the virus, uh, that created a really confusing environment for travelers and operating airlines and airports as well. So um, that, that was done for a reason, but now we have an opportunity to reopen the, the globe in a more harmonized way. And when states agree on the measures and mutually recognize measures between states, that will make for a far more orderly restart of the operation, as well as a more predictable travel experience for customers. And that is really key in terms of uh, the restoring confidence to the, in the travel public and the rest of the travel and tourism uh, ecosystem. So success will really depend on the, the collaboration with the governments and we uh, with the rest of the industry, uh, the industry stakeholders. Next slide, please. So why is it a matter of urgency? Well, in normal times, you know, you've seen the impact that it has on around the globe now, but in normal time, aviation drives more or less around $2.7 trillion worth of the GDP. It creates directly or indirectly nearly 66 million jobs around the world. 
it moves more of a third of the trade uh, value, a uh, trade by value of goods around the world. So a huge, huge uh, uh, contributor of the, uh, the the cargo environment. And as you see during the, the current COVID uh, fighting, uh, it really facilitated the healthcare in the emergency as many aircraft were used to transport medical supplies and protective equipment. So it's huge to uh, help in, in fighting the current crisis uh, with the COVID. And once the crisis is over, it's going to be uh, really necessary to reconnect people and re, uh, reconnect the businesses and, and restart and kickstart the economies. So clearly aviation is a vital driver of the world's recovery. So this is so important that we get it back on track. Next slide, please. So uh, as today's focus will be on the travel experience, it's good to know that uh, IATA has worked again with our partners on a, on a larger restart plan, which really looks into two large bucket. To the left is a system restart, which basically is designed to be a set of measures and actions that will make sure that the, the planes get back in the sky and under the system capability uh, blue box as you see there's a number of actions that we're taking with uh, with um, the airlines themselves making sure that we speak with governments to uh, look at the licensing of operating crews and the, 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 the relaxations of the rules around that as many crews were grounded for for weeks so there's complexities around getting the safety uh, back uh, the, the the crews back in the air in a safe way uh, also working with the rest of our partners in the in the ecosystem making sure that we have the air navigation service providers back back on track with full operations same thing with our airports capacity and the ground handlers so there's a, a large set of actions that we're taking to restore the the, the system capability Today's webinar is really about the green box, which is the travel experience. So what passenger process will be put in place and what measures will be taken to mitigate the uh, the risk of further transmission of COVID-19? And this is uh, this is what you're going to hear in far and more details um, following um, following my presentation and at once the right part of the industry restart is then about creating the demand so if we have the system capability back on track and a safe uh, travel experience um, how can we demonstrate that states will now feel confident to relax the travel restrictions and the public will be confident to fly so there's more measures to be taken on that but the first two are very necessary and then we just need to get back with the rest of the um, the governments, but also our partners in the travel and tourism industry to make sure that we create and we stimulate the demand. So we have to keep it. Uh, we have to keep the air travel affordable, as many uh, many people were impacted for their jobs during the situation. So clearly, uh, travel will be um, something to be decided by them in terms of spending money. So we need to make sure we have the right environment. We make it make it affordable and attractive. And so when people get to destination, they also have something to do. So the rest of the travel and tourism ecosystem has got to be also ready to uh, to greet these people and, and accommodate them. So by and large, this has been a, a very, um, a very cooperative exercise with our key industry partners. And uh, I'll turn it over to actually my colleague, uh, industry colleague Antoine from from ACI World will take you through the timelines and the, the guiding principles of the plan. Antoine, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Pierre, for the uh, introduction and uh, thank you, uh, Ayada. Uh, we're going to hear quite a few times, I think, during this presentation and you're Pierre already uh, mentioning the importance of collaboration, industry alignment and, and, and having, I think, uh, Ayada and ACI on, the, on this uh, uh, webinar is uh, demonstrate that it's a, it's a key thing and we have to target in the in a, uh, same objectives to make sure, like Pierre said, that uh, passengers can expect a similar experience wherever they go. But Celine will talk about this a bit uh, further down. In terms of um, industry restart, uh, you see different types of uh, phases be be uh, being illustrated. You have here three different phases. Sometimes you see four, two, depending to <laughs> which entity you talk. The key message is that it's a gradual changing environment, process and demand throughout this restart recovery and back to a new normal or whatever we can call down the right. So of course everyone is hoping and expecting to get to the right in the green section as soon as possible. We all know unfortunately that uh, the challenge is big 
is going to take uh, two to three years to get to a more regular normals as we had at the beginning of 2020. But let's uh, work together to uh, get this uh, get to this green section as soon as possible. If you, if you look at the uh, left side, the, the immediate uh, uh, restart phase, that's what's taking place actually right now in several areas of the world. I mean, we heard some positive numbers. I think just yesterday I heard about 22% of a volume of flights in the EU uh, were starting, uh, uh, were flying. So a good sign, still low numbers. But during this initial phases, uh, there'll be a smaller volume of passengers, would be 10, 20, 30% of a volume of passengers. And of course, measures that are deployed that during that time uh, are different and are need always to be based on facts. At ECI, we always talk, and Ayala has the same thing about database decision making. Well, in this case, measures have to fit medical data requirements and evolve over time. And I think if one key uh, principle is important to remember is throughout the phases, the immediate one, intermediate, or the new normal uh, at a later stage, measures have to fit the present situation. And what's important also is that measures in a local area, state and infrastructure, would be in public transport, have to fit what's required also at the airport. We don't want at airports and at airlines and with stakeholders to be stuck with measures that are going to be staying even though the medical or the pandemic uh, situation has evolved and changes. So the immediate uh, uh, initial phase, smaller volume. The yellow part in the middle, that's when you start and we estimate you know, Q4 uh, uh, probably of this year, end of Q3, depending on the region, for about a year, a ramp up of volume of passengers. So going to uh, uh, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent of volume of passengers. So very different uh, capacity, throughput, demand, and measures that are going to need to be uh, meeting the reality of uh, the pandemic, but the reality also of what's taking place at airports and in general in public areas. And of course, then the green one uh, that we all want again as soon as possible, but understanding that during uh, in this green area, there'll probably be certain things that change even if we go back to normal. But let's focus on the short term first and make sure we get the um, volume back into our airports. One last notion in terms of these phases, communications to passengers is going to be extremely important. Of course, we all talk about reassuring the traveling public. So it's one thing to reassure them in terms of demonstrating all that is done for their health and for their safety, as we do for security. But it's also important to make sure that everything is shared in terms of what is done and what is expected as airport. And of course, like we we're saying, we try to align everything to make sure there's not different set of rules and measures and expectations at every airport and with every airline, but that we have a general way of processing so that we can reassure, but manage expectations of passengers as well. You can go to the next slide. When we talk about uh, recovery, uh, the key thing is that there's no silver bullet in terms of uh, the perfect measures uh, to be deployed uh, uh, throughout the travel journey and the end-to-end -end travel journey of passengers. There's a whole set of recommended measures or suggested measures, and then airport airlines and different stakeholders, regulators, government, have to make sure to have uh, uh, deploy the measures that are needed and have a and outcome based uh, measures. So it's the results that's important and it can be done in different ways. Uh, different airports of different size have different realities, just like airlines as well. The process, the layout, access to the airport. Often we say at ACI, at Airport Council, that when you've seen one airport, well, you've seen one airport. Every single airport is different. So this layered uh, approach, this outcome based approach, this risk based approach is very important. And again, based on scientific evidence. Again, it's data. It's not perception, it's data. Uh, we have to go on data and data that evolves. And like I was saying on the different stages of a, of a restart or recovery, we have to make sure to work, work with health experts that can define the data and the related requirements. And hopefully these diminish over time. But, and knock on wood, no one wishes it, there could be a second wave and then maybe have to backtrack a little bit before we continue moving forward. 
but always based on scientific evidence. The risk-based approach is also that different situations uh, in different states in the world are going at different pace and start uh, starting uh, started with the pandemic earlier than others. Some evolved at different speeds. So we can imagine different bubbles of, uh, of our, uh, bilateral, also risk-based arrangements between states. They could be also using different measures with uh, passengers to be able to have a risk-based approach in terms of evaluating uh, health measures or risk that can be uh, uh, related to this. Uh, next slide, please. Now, there's a whole list of guiding principles, but, but this slide gives uh, some of the, the most important one, we, we believe, as a, uh, with uh, IATA and NACI. And, and again, we're very aligned. We published some joint uh, document. We were involved in industry documents. But I think the, the first one is that the measures should be introduced as far upstream as possible. So first of all, we need to minimize the risk of cont contagion uh, within the airport environment. But also you want to facilitate the process and there are already a lot of opportunities for passengers to initiate the process that are required for travel before they get to the airport. So minimize health risk, but also increase uh, 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 operational and process efficiency. The more uh, the process is efficient and on the move and touchless, uh, the less crowds, the less queues, the less congregation of people and from a security or from a health perspective, everything is facilitated. There are already a lot of initiatives, as you know, through um, IATA and uh, with ACI, that encourage uh, regulators to facilitate also regulation to deploy some of these measures. And we, of course, as a uh, key industry stakeholders, encourage all of those uh, to be done. So passengers should be um, if, uh, encouraged to arrive at the airport with most steps done and processed to again minimize what needs to be done on site at the airport. The second point here is, is again collaboration and collaboration sounds very nice and uh, you know everyone's going to agree. We need true collaboration. We need to make sure that everyone truly listens uh, to each other and actually I'm very happy personally of seeing the collaboration we have had since the beginning of this, these challenging times. Again, alignment and one very good example, which is in brackets here at the end of point two, is the ICAO Council Aviation Recovery Task Force, the CART. For those of you who haven't heard, heard this, ICAO created this task force and asked, of course, several of their state uh, members to be part of it, but also industry stakeholders such as IATA, Airport Council Interna International, ACI, but also the World Health Organization, the World Tourism and Travel Council, and several other associations to make sure in a very short time to provide guidelines targeted mostly to regulators and state, but to ensure it's also aligned with documents that you must have seen from IATA, from ACI, all pushing in the same direction. And I think this is a key uh, document. If you haven't uh, seen it, I encourage you to, to have access to it uh, through the web and the ICO uh, website and you'll see uh, the alignment with all documents produced by both our association, IATA and ACI. Third point here is that measure should only last for as long as required. This fits pretty much with what I was saying a bit earlier. We have to adapt to a changing situation and measures being deployed initially in initial phases with low number of passengers can be expected to be very different to measures when the volumes of passengers are much larger. It's a, a kind of a domino effect. When the health situation becomes better in cities and measures are relaxed a little bit, same thing should happen at airports, which in turn brings more passengers to travel and then provides opportunity to treat and process more passengers in an experience that's also agreeable for passengers to, to go from point to point. So we have to constantly reevaluate uh, uh, what's, uh, what's there. And uh, the last point on over there, and it could be me many other, uh, other measures, is that existing roles and responsibilities of all stakeholders, but of governments, airlines, airport, should remain the same. So in general, for a general perspective, health measures have to be uh, guided, implemented, and funded by, by states. Airlines have all their own responsibilities, airports as well. 
we collaborate, we know where it overlaps, and we've worked quite a bit to be ready for the existing already starting restart. But we have to continue to work together, encourage states involvement. We have seen a lot of programs from states in terms of a general uh, economy uh, support of uh, different states, countries and workers through these challenging times. And we encourage, of course, the uh, same type of support through uh, the um, aviation industry as engines of the uh, economics for the cities and the states uh, where they're at. So uh, on this, looking forward to discuss at the end of the uh, presentation, but I'd like to uh, let Celine from Ayata continue the presentation, looking uh, more specifically at the passenger experience and process. Thank you. Thank you, Antoine. Um, and, and I'll get back to um, uh, your points. Indeed, there's um, in absence of uh, silver bullet solutions, um, IATA, we heard SCI um, have issued a series of, of guidelines for each step of the process. And now um, we'll go through uh, the high level perspective of um, IATA processes. Um, those have been um, drafted uh, to ensure the, the risk of contaminations are, are mitigated uh, and that air travel is not a vector for COVID-19 transmission. So, um, these measures again are seen as uh, uh, implemented for a temporary period and they might evolve as new tool as tests or vaccines are available. So now let's dig a little bit more in this layered approach um, to see what are the components, what does it mean for airlines, airports, uh, but more importantly also for, for passengers. Uh, next slide, please. So um, if we start with the pre-flight, um, so we foresee the need for governments to collect more passenger contact and, and travel information, which can be used for contact uh, tracing purposes. A number of governments have understood the necessity to collect this information in an electronic and centralized manner. Um, most, many of them have set up website portals where passengers can, at their convenience, uh, very often two to three days before departure, provide uh, additional details about their full itinerary. And as those portals um, are fully customizable, they may also be used for passengers to declare to the best of their knowledge, obviously, um, that they are symptoms free and they have not been exposed to the virus. Uh, so what does happen when um, we, we move to the checking process? Well, generally airlines open their, their checking process uh, 24 hours before departure. Um, there are then basically two options for them, um, whether they can uh, check in, in advance uh, via mobile phone or, or airline website, or they can wait until they arrive at the airport and use a self-service kiosk uh, or go to an airline agent. Um, so whereas IATA encourages, strongly encourages passengers to complete as much as possible um, the, the, the process uh, before going to the airport, um, reality is that there are still uh, obstacles and um, those are of different natures. Um, and if I pick two of them, um, the, the, the first one would be that in many instances, uh, governments um, uh, still require um, visa, uh, electronic travel authorization, and sometimes they are not um, integrated. Um, so company would need to manually verify passengers, uh, passports and, and, and travel authorization. Um, Another example could be that um, when there are several carriers involved in, in the transaction, it might also be uh, a problem uh, linked to the communication of, of the, between their, their system. Uh, now let's uh, move to departure airports. Um, what happens um, there? Um, so when the uh, passengers arrive um, at the terminal, um, we suggest the, the access should be restricted as much as possible to workers, travelers, and uh, eventually the accompanying person for passengers uh, with specific conditions. So um, it could be people with uh, person with disabilities or reduced mobility, 
or unaccompanied children, but we would like to limit it to specific case, at least in the first period um, that Antoine uh, mentioned earlier. Um, on another point, there is, um, uh, and, and uh, on the point of temperature screening, um, I'd like to mention it because um, it's been uh, also uh, in, in the press and very often. Um, there is no general consensus among states to implement temperature screening. But we think that where it is mandated, um, it should be done at the uh, entry point to the terminal building um, and in a rapid and non obtrusive way. Um, in such instances, they should be performed by professionally trained uh, staff who can also decide whether a person is fit to fly uh, or not. So in conjunction with the um, local airport and, and, and government authorities, um, passenger flow should um, through the terminal um, so we are talking about mainly the, the checking, immigration, security, departure launch, airport, airline launches, boarding. And they need to be modified to ensure physical distancing at every step of the process. Um, so SEI there has developed excellent guidance with example of this. Um, uh, and I, I recommend you to, to, to look at those. Uh, passenger needs also to be informed um, about the, the new measures they might expect at the, at the airport. So um, you see on, on the graphs and illustrations, um, each of the passenger once in the airport environment is wearing mask. Um, we need to be able to communicate uh, this information to, to them as, as a, uh, industry partners. Um, another uh, critical element um, that, that is being um, introduced uh, to restart the operation is obviously um, the, the proper cleaning and sanitization of the equipment and infrastructure. So this also applies to um, uh, such items as carts, trolleys, e-gates, um, self-service kiosk, wheelchairs, trays. We can also think of now uh, the new uh, disposal containers uh, for use the uh, face covering mask and onboard equipment, obviously. I mean, th that's not a, an exhaustive um, list. Um, some other elements, uh, part of, of the layered approach that are not here uh, now, but um, we could maybe see in the future, um, are uh, the uh, COVID test and immunity passport. So in principle, um, we believe that reliable, fast and, and scalable COVID test uh, and immunity passport could play a role in, in the future. Um, however, such tests are not yet ready and medical evidence regarding immunity for COVID-19 uh, is still inconclusive. So immunity passports are not currently supported, but that might change in the future and uh, eventually change um, the uh, layered approach that we will continue to uh, present you during this webinar. So now let's uh, look at the airport processes. Um, as we mentioned, physical uh, distancing should be observed at all steps of the process, including at counters and self-service kiosk. Um, at airports, self-service options should be made available and utilized as much as possible. Um, to that extent, we are uh, witnessing a general move towards a greater use of touchless technology, biometrics and, and options to operate kiosk remotely from a mobile device. Um, so we are also looking at, at uh, providing standard for, for those operations. Uh, nevertheless, uh, deploying such solution is um, also a great challenge um, as most of the, the stakeholders are running out of cash and investment in technology and, and equipment has uh, very often be uh, deferred. So investing in technology is how we are supporting, but in, in practice, it's, it's very difficult at the moment. Um, next slide, please. Now, if we look at um, the, the, the next step in, uh, in the process um, and, and going to boarding. Well, boarding is traditionally um, a very complex touch point. Um, 
quite stressful for passengers as well. And uh, I'm sure you've all experienced um, all, all experienced that. Uh, but we might now have an opportunity to redesign a more orderly boarding process. Um, it's a key element um, to ensure that physical uh, distancing uh, is, is respected on the ground. Um, this also means, for instance, that um, uh, new processes have to be put in place. And, and um, if we think um, of carry-on baggages, um, we recommend they should be limited simply to simplify and facilitate a, a smooth boarding and, and avoid also uh, too much movement uh, on board. Um, so airlines have been uh, working on revisiting their processes and, and airports as well. They've worked on, on redesigning the, the, the gate areas um, to cope with the new situation. Uh, so to support um, our members, um, IATA and SCI also recommend the increased use of automation at the gate as well. Um, so in terms of automation, we can think of um, um, boarding pass um, self-scanning options, uh, biometric recognition, uh, and as uh, the uh, self-scanning of passport uh, becomes widely uh, more widely used, um, there would be uh, an opportunity also for, for governments, we hope, to revisit the requirements they currently impose for positive ID checks uh, at the gate. Um, because it creates interaction uh, between agents and, and passengers and, and um, there is uh, the transfer of, of paper between uh, two parties and, and this is what we want to avoid as well. Uh, now, once on board, um, what happens? Well, it's, it's certainly a topic that has led to extensive press coverage and, and for this reason, um, we've planned to dedicate a full webinar on the topic, so please join us on the 7th of July uh, and you'll get a, a full insight um, of the, the measures taken on board. Uh, but now I'll, I'll, I'll give you a brief overview and in few words, um, how can we describe the, the process uh, on board? Um, how can we secure it um, so that physical distancing uh, is, is not uh, needed? Uh, based on the information we have analyzed, um, the risk of transmission of COVID-19 from one passenger to another one on board remains very low. And the reason for that uh, are there over mitigation measures on board that are not uh, on the ground. Um, so for instance, uh, passengers sit forward um, and not towards each other, uh, sit back provide also an additional barrier. Uh, the use of EPA filters, um, I think you, you all know that by now. Um, the direction also of the airflow uh, from uh, the ceiling to the floor and the limited movement um, of uh, people on board once seated is, is also an additional uh, protection. So as um, uh, an added uh, protection against possible in-flight transmission. Um, IATA also recommends uh, the use of face covering um, on board. So for all these reasons, uh, physical distancing is uh, not necessary and there's no need to block um, the, the famous uh, middle seat. But we have um, uh, developed comprehensive guidelines. Um, they are available on our website and, and I think a link will be provided to you for consultation. Uh, we also have guidance for cabin crew um, uh, that also include the management of suspected cases for communicable disease on board. It's important for uh, the staff also to, to have appropriate guidance and, and know the process to follow. And uh, obviously, they are all aligned with the World Health Organization uh, guidelines. So, IATA continues to work with ICAO, WHO, and the aeromedical uh, community um, to monitor those, uh, the situation as the number of flights also increases. And it's um, a key point for us. 
Now, what happens at uh, transfer? Um, and and um, Antoine mentioned it uh, a bit earlier. We really encourage um, governments to uh, leverage the uh, opportunity they have to recognize each other's security measures. So the, the so-called recognition of, of equivalence uh, principle in uh, aviation security. So that means that if a country recognizes the uh, measures taken at departure airport, um, then in, in the country of um, transfer, uh, passenger would not need to be rescreened. And, and we think that um, it would be very valuable in the sense that um, it avoids, again, uh, additional contacts. Um, and uh, obviously, um, it will help everybody to cope with the uh, additional delayed uh, expected uh, with the, um, the new process. Um, before going to, to, to borders and customs and as um, um, passengers recuperate their, their baggage, um, all efforts should really be made to provide a speedy baggage claim process and, and ensure that passengers are not made to wait for excessive amount of time in the baggage claim area. So, for example, all available belts um, should be made use of um, in order to allow this, this uh, physical distancing. And then once uh, passengers go through border and uh, customs, um, it is suggested uh, that governments simplify border control formalities um, by enabling, for instance, contactless process, um, reading passport information at distance, um, relying on biometric recognition. Um, another tool could be to set up dedicated and, and special lanes. Um, and and uh, an element also part of um, the, the prevention is also to train their uh, staff, border agent staff, um, to recognize a person that would be uh, unwell and an and incoming passenger that, that would look unwell. Um, so where declarations are required also on arrival, um, governments should also consider electronic options um, so passenger can then prepare their, their declaration um, before or they arrive um, at the airport and, and thereby um, they would minimize the human to uh, human contact. Uh, and another tool uh, illustrated on, on the slide here is also for customs to uh, leverage and, and use different um, uh, tools such as the, the, the red and, and green lane uh, for passengers to self-declare and uh, which provides uh, another option that avoid the, the, the transmission of uh, declaration, paper declaration. Next slide, please. So, as passengers um, uh, are about to exit the, um, the airport, um, what happened next? Well, it depends also on the, uh, the measures in place at, at the airport. Uh, but first off, uh, passengers have to be clearly informed of the measures that are in place in, um, and give clear instruction um, on, on what they need to, um, to do if they develop uh, symptoms uh, uh, after their arrival, um, who they can contact, um, how to, to, to deal with the, uh, the process. Um, and obviously, um, if there's any additional step that they, they might take. So uh, we see currently there are still some countries that impose quarantine. If they need to uh, self-quarantine or quarantine at a dedicated facility, uh, this information needs to, um, to, to, to be provided to passengers at that time. Um, now, if temperature screening um, is required by local regulation, uh, non-intrusive mass equipment need to be used. Um, and, and the screening should be conducted again by appropriately trained staff uh, who can safely deal with the possibility of uh, heal passengers. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
So in conclusion, and again, um, there is um, no single measure that can mitigate all the biosafety risk for restarting air travel. But implementing all the above range of measures that are already uh, possible is the most effective way uh, of balancing risk mitigation with the need to unlock economies uh, and to enable travel to restart immediately. Uh, and, and as further uh, progress is achieved in terms of additional measures such as uh, effective COVID-19 tests and, and immunity uh, passports, um, new measures can be incorporated in, in the passenger process to further mitigate the, the risk and build confidence uh, in air travel. Uh, so this will take us further on, on the journey toward um, a resumption of normal operations, hopefully. And um, with that, we'll be happy to um, uh, answer your, your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much, very Celine. Much. Uh, thank you, Pierre uh, and Antoine. Uh, just before moving to questions, I'd just like to remind everybody that the webinar is taking place under antitrust guidelines, which means we're unable to discuss any commercially competitive sensitive topics outside the scope of the agenda. Um, and we also can't comment or discuss on individual policies uh, or commercial decisions uh, between airlines and their suppliers or customers. So moving uh, immediately on to the questions, and um, we have a question from somebody who is in direct contact with um, the travelling public and they would like to know three main points um, that they can pass on to their customers to help assure them um, that travel is safe with the new norms. So Pierre, maybe that's for you. Yeah, I think we'll we'll, uh, we'll take we'll, we'll take one each. I think. Okay. <laughs> so I think, I think uh, no, but I think this is a place where we can all chip in now. But I would say the very first thing uh, that that customers need to know is the guidance that that is put in the measures that are put in place are really guided by medical evidence. This is not. This is not something that the airlines or airports are trying to push uh, for commercial uh, matters. It's really about following what the the medical experts uh, are 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 telling us uh, and, and finding um, finding ways to make sure that we we fully mitigate the risk. So that that would be certainly one very uh, very important point where each of the each of these. Um, uh, each of these guidance against is really um, is really um, taken into consideration. Um, I don't know Antoine or Celine if there's others. Yeah, you sure. want to if you don't mind me, then uh, th there's so many uh, different measures. I think the key thing uh, I would remind all passengers as a second point would be that safety and security will always remain priority number one for all of us. And health uh, uh, requirements are part of the safety health health measures. And there's a whole wide range of protocol that have been defined and, and, and maybe one specific one I would add is regarding staff. We talk a lot about passengers, the process and and Celine touched on that as well. But for staff working at airports from all stakeholders, there's rigorous protocols to protect them, but to make sure also they are uh, um, healthy and have uh, pose no risk to to passengers. So so uh, that's I think a key a second point in terms of priorities of all stakeholders. Thanks. So I'll be happy to, to take the, the third point. Uh, I think that um, air transport has been under such scrutiny uh, that all the stakeholders are relieved on their best to demonstrate that they are able to cope with the threat and, and ensure passengers can have a, a safe journey. Um, and I was talking to a few people who had the opportunity to fly again, um, and uh, they mentioned that they felt more uh, safe going through the airport and flying than going to their um, um, drugstore or, or to the supermarket nearby. So um, I think all the measures have now been um, implemented and, and we just need more passengers to fly again and, and to be able to witness that um, it's safe to fly in and, and, and uh, operations can can be uh, back to normal. Thank you. And um, we have another question. What involvement are IATA and ACI having with individual governments to promote the guidance and the temporary guidance that's being published? And do you think that there's sufficient understanding of the requirements for safe air travel? 
Okay, uh, since I, I I can start and I'm sure when you can we can <clears throat> definitely uh, jump in as we're both heavily involved with uh, that. So I think uh, uh, Antoine mentioned in the presentation that uh, we um, uh, we ICAO has uh, as, um, uh, put the task force on recovery uh, that we call CART uh, in place exactly for that matter. It was really to work very closely with industry and provide the and work in additional guidance and strengthen the guidance that was provided so that this this was distributed to all the states around the world that uh, of ICAO members so we have very very uh, closely developed <coughs> sorry these measures and uh, and and in um, each of our organization as well with our own association uh, local association and regional association we've also reached out to the local governments through our own network to make sure we promote this document and we discuss it and we see where there might be either deviance, uh, deviations or different opinions so certainly there's been a lot of uh, a lot of direct engagement and Antoine feel free to join because you're also very uh, closely involved in the, in the drafting of the of the guidance Yes, uh, thank you, Pierre. Uh, very well said. I mean, the, the first thing we're um, both uh, IATA and SCI and pe people, uh, most people on this on this webinar are, are based in Montreal, where ICAO is based. And, and that's the principal reason is to be closer right across the street, actually from her office uh, building where we hope soon to be back. But uh, the pro proximity facilitates exchanges. And uh, uh, like uh, Pierre said, the ICAO uh, CART document is a key document and that was produced again very rapidly and aimed at regulators. It's a recommended practices so they, it's not a standard, there's no laws, regulators are always and remain free uh, to decide uh, what they do in their own states. We're uh, encouraging alignment and backed with medical medical data and IATA have their own professional and experts and uh, we have some of our own to back up. It's not just an opinion, it's based on, on, on data. Before even the CART document was uh, launched about uh, two, three weeks ago, uh, we at ACI at had our, our guidance uh, documents just like IATA had. And through our regional offices, in case of ACI, we have five regional offices. IATA had several as well throughout the world, encouraging these re regional offices to work with their local states and governments to guide, encourage, and align. So there's been quite a bit of work and actually I, I think it's never perfect, but we've been fairly uh, successful at this stage and let's hope it continues. And these webinars are part of it as well. Thank you. Uh, another question on, on the length of time that we expect these measures to be in place. How long do we think the need for additional measures and additional cleaning and PPE requirements will be in place during the travel process. Uh, when will it return to pre-COVID levels or when when will become the new normality? Celine, you want to try this one? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the uh, questions are to you. <laughs> no, it's it's a fair question. And um, I think it's, um, we, we are all wondering uh, when the, we will get back to normal and now the, the subsequent question is that um, will we ever get back to uh, a, a pre-COVID situation and it's uh, very hard to say. Um, um, a large party uh, part of the population has um, also been traumatized or um, has developed fears and um, so we we need also as an industry organization and and as we are looking at passenger experience um take into consideration um everybody's situation and, and case and 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 try to develop measures um that um will provide uh, the best experience to 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 most of our um passengers so uh we see that most probably um the uh cleaning of equipment um, will remain. Uh, we will have much more cleaning that we had before and I don't think anybody will complain. Um, we know that obviously um, there is a, a cost associated and, and it has to be uh, mitigated. Um, but I'm not sure that in terms of process we will ever get back to uh, pre-COVID. Um, this being said, there will be an evolution in terms of um, uh, if we refer to to uh, temperature screening and 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 uh, so the the type of measure that uh, might be a bit uh, more intrusive, 
Um, those will be phased out as uh, new protective measures comes in. So as I was mentioning, um, if um, there is, for instance, immunity passport or if um, the, the risk of COVID-19 is uh, fully eradicated. Um, so uh, progressively, the, we see the measures will change, but definitively they will not um, all go away and, and, and sometimes for good reasons. I think uh, nobody will complain if um, um, airports and aircraft are better clean than they used to. So. Thank you. And can I jump in if you don't mind? Yeah, yeah, please. please. Yes, I fully agree with Celine and a new normal. Everyone has a crystal ball trying to see what exactly it's it is going to be and probably certain things will be different. But there are certain actually through a, a challenging time, some opportunities and we touched on Celine was mentioning touchless technology and and uh, and more on the move type of technology. And we can expect in terms of maybe not on measures, but a consequence of the present situation an acceleration in the offer of such touchless and, and on the move type of technology and pre-travel offering. So that's a change in process, but there's also a good in this because it's going to offer more opportunities and probably an even more efficient process. So so there's health measures and we'll see how much disappear over time and what might stay in terms of also behavior and expectations. But in the process itself, I think there's also an opportunity to try to find something that's optimistic as well. Thank you. Thank you. And next question, what is IATA's opinion about keeping 50% seating capacity? Okay, I can I can certainly start on that. I think for us, as we mentioned, and as Celine mentioned, um, and we have also an additional expert uh, online with us, our, our expert from the, the, the cabin safety environment, Jonathan, who will, will invite to step in. But the all the medical evidence that we have so far has, has really uh, pointed against very little risk of transmission on board. Um, and there's a number of technical measures that also add to this, whether they're filters, whether there's the dynamics on board, whether there's new norms of, of doing service that really uh, does not make it necessary. And, and for that reason, and it's only because of you know, long-term commercial viability, but um, this is why we have not advocated for, for that uh, measure to be required. And uh, with your permission, I'll invite uh, Jonathan maybe to, uh, to add uh, a bit of that as he's our resident expert in this area. Jonathan? Sorry, Pierre. Um, yeah, that, that is our position that we are not recommending that it is enforced. Uh, we're also looking at the regulators that are uh, requiring certain rules around the world and the regulators are also agreeing with us in the majority of cases. I've only seen a handful of regulators that are mandating physical distancing on board the aircraft in the seating. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, on to the next question. Does IATA, re does IATA well, recommend? Uh, Catherine, sorry, I just I just uh, meant to mention something though. I just to, as Jonathan said, um, th this the the position here is the one from from IATA, right? In terms of that, but we we're very conscious that we have seen some of our member airlines doing this as a as a practice. Uh, because they feel they had to really do this extra step to to provide you know customers with some confidence to to get back uh, in the air and this is not something we necessarily can prevent it's it's up to the airline's choice to do that but just wanted to point out that from a, our position is really based on the medical evidence but airlines have the flexibility obviously to to uh, do what they feel is uh, is probably uh, helpful for them to um, to uh, get the customer's confidence um, back. So I'll just point, that was important to point this out. Back to you, Catherine. Thank you. Um, we have a question, I think this will be for uh, Jonathan again. So airlines have different approaches to PPE for cabin crew. Does IATA recommend the use of medical grade masks or face and full body protection for crew, crew members? IATA only recommends what is appropriate to the situation. Um, it's always worth remembering that PPE is the measure to protect the person wearing it, with the exception of masks, which is uh, everybody's responsibility to contain droplets uh, in the air. So if the circumstances dictate that there are you know, the necessity for uh, more extreme uh, personal protection, then yes, IATA would recommend that. 
but generally overall we don't recommend the use of anything other than face masks, coverings and gloves at the moment. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, does, IACA, does IATA recommend that processes such as check-in, immigration and security be decentralised in an effort to control the number of passengers that pass through a particular zone? That's why you want to, yeah, you want to this one or? Yes, I can definitely touch on this. Uh, again, all this is related to um, processing all different touch points and the recommendation that uh, we jointly uh, uh, have to encourage any process, any part of the process that can be done ahead of time. A little bit like we've been deployed uh, with check-in. Uh, 15, 20 years ago, everyone remembers all of check-in steps were taking place in front of the check-in counter. We broke down the process and passengers have the choice to do as much as possible before they get to the airport, whether it be a mobile boarding pass, home printed boarding pass, bag tags, we're talking permanent bag tags, a kiosk, a bag drop, or an agent. A bit the same thing should be looked at from a immigrations, customs, even security screening, where having an outcome base and a risk-based approach and the opportunity like Celine was describing to uh, for governments encouraging them to collect information about the passengers as early as possible and if there's additional health measures questioning or information required to collect this ahead of time pre-airport or before arrivals all this helps in limiting the time of the process and ideally have a touchless situation and on the move situation so i think there's a lot more also opportunity like i was just saying to help deploy some of these uh, 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 processes that are completely touches and technologies. The limitation, to be honest, is not really on the technology uh, side of things. It's usually on the regulation side of things. And, and we that, that's why we really encourage states to facilitate, adapt local regulations to be able to, uh, for airlines, airports, and other stakeholders to deploy such of these uh, opportunities to collect information ahead, break down the processes, offer more options to passengers, and to facilitate and accelerate the efficiency of these touch points and limit them. Thank you. Um, I think we've got time for about two or three more questions. So the first one is, many authorities are issuing or creating their own passenger health locator form instead of using the ICAO version as published in ICAO Annex 9. Can IATA support uh, endeavours to motivate authorities to use the ICAO standard form? Yeah, Celine, you want to take this one? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, <clears throat> we uh, we are aware of these um, of this situation and um, we do work with um, ICAO, but also the, the World Health Organization um, to promote the um, use of, of the uh, recognized uh, form. Um, and um, we we also want to open the discussions to um, to have this form uh, standardized in, a, in an electronic way as well. Um, this will simplify the process, uh, will allow also passengers um, to fill this declaration uh, before they, they even reach to uh, the, the health authorities. Um, so we see many, many advantages. Um, another critical point is to uh, seek harmonization of uh, the questions that um, authorities may ask. And um, a very basic element is that we've witnessed that the list of symptoms that uh, uh, some states uh, ask passengers to declare are not necessarily the same from one country to the other. So that poses a, a number of challenges uh, for the operator and, and for uh, the passengers who do not have any certainty uh, about uh, the, uh, the, the their travel and whether they will be accepted uh, in the country of arrival or not. So um, yes, uh, we think, I mean, there, there are still a, most of the countries do follow those those uh, guidelines, but we, we still encourage them through ICAO and, and, and WHO um, to uh, adhere much more to, to, to what exists already. 
Thank you very much, Celine. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining the webinar. We do have uh, a number of questions that have not been answered. We will be um, downloading these and going through them and drafting answers to these and posting these on iata.org, so you should be able to have an answer to your questions. Um, before we close, um, I'd just like to thank you again for joining us and like to remind you that we have another webinar as part of the Industry Restart webinar series. It's System Capability Part 2 on Slots and Supply Chains, and that is tomorrow um, from 2 to 3 o'clock Central European time. So thank you very much for joining us, and we hope you're able to join us again tomorrow. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.